Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Tony Woodward, and I'll do my best to step in for uh, Dr. Suzanne Mazur um, as the moderator for this week. Also, I'd like to just take a moment to thank Emily Rice, who does an amazing job coordinating these Grand Rounds and really does so very quietly in the background. So, Emily, thank you. We apologize for the virtual-only option. As many of you know, we had a water leak at Seattle Children's, and Wright Auditorium was affected. You'll get an evaluation afterwards from Emily in the CME office. Please take a couple minutes to fill that out. It really helps us improve our program and maintain the accreditation of this education. And as a last note, we don't have any financial relationships to discuss. So getting on to the really important part, it, it, our guest speaker today is Dr. Mark Lowe. And Mark is an amazing physician in person. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing Mark since about 2009 when we were lucky enough to recruit him for fellowship and then ecstatic to recruit him for faculty in 2012 as a pediatric emergency medicine physician. He's also a medical informaticist and a medical director of digital health and telemedicine at or telehealth at Seattle Children's. He's a clinical associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He attended medical school at the University of Vermont and completed his pediatric residency at UCSF and then his pediatric emergency medicine fellowship at the University of Washington. As I mentioned, he's an amazing PDM, PDM physician in addition to all the informatics work that he's also an expert in. Dr. Lowe has been involved in expanding telehealth capabilities at Seattle Children's, including modalities such as live and asynchronous telemedicine, as well as remote patient management. He guided uh, Seattle Children's and all of us through the COVID-19 pandemic conversion in rapid time to virtual care and really helped us maintain the care and health of the, our community and our patients at a time when travel was very difficult. He established telehealth as an ongoing care modality, as well as navigating the post-public health emergency landscape. He evaluates and leads implementation of new digital health tools and technologies that help improve patient and clinician engagement, as well as positively impact clinical quality of care and reduce cost. In addition to the emergent and urgent medical care of children, he is passionate about innovating how technology can be used to influence and transform transform pediatric health care, especially for those with limited access and underserved populations. He doesn't only work at Seattle Children's and the University of Washington, he's also a voting member of the Washington State Telehealth Collaborative and sits on the steering boards of the Pediatric Emergency Medicine Section for Epic Systems, as well as the Seattle Children's Care Network. I'm really proud and privileged to introduce Mark as our speaker today. Thanks for uh, having me. It's great to be here virtually uh, yet again. Um, wish we could be there in person, could eat some donuts, but uh, I'm glad to share with you uh, the work that we're doing. Digital health and pediatrics, hope and hype. I really like alliteration, and I thought this was a pretty clever title until I started reading this great book by Robert Walker um, from UCSF called The Digital Doctor, Hope, Hype, and Harm at the Dawn of Medicine's Computer Age. And I highly recommend it. He, he got an extra H in there. I thought that this topic was kind of a nice transition as we've gone through the grand rounds this year, uh, starting with Dr. Uh, Rivera's talk on the future of the pediatric subspecialist workforce. And then last week with Dr. Ellington talking about global health and digital innovation. And here we are talking about digital health as a whole in pediatrics. I also like to highlight some of the great work that some of our current faculty and former residents have been doing. So you'll see some of their papers uh, scattered through this talk and uh, everyone's making some pretty exciting strides in this field. So I have no uh, conflicts of interest to disclose. I talk about a lot of different products, but no disclosures. And so uh, as you saw from the rolling slide, these are our objectives, really trying to define digital health even beyond telehealth. And we'll get into that because every talk has to mention AI. I also mention AI here with machine learning and AI, uh, artificial intelligence, large language models, and then really getting into kind of what are the hopes for digital health and pediatrics? And then what's hype? What's uh, limitations, inequities, cautions? And then try to anticipate the future and how do we prepare? So uh, image jeopardy is a lot easier when we're in person, uh, but I can pretend that I, I'm seeing you and, uh, and calling on you. And uh, I'll just make this rhetorical jeopardy, but a couple of different images to get started. So. Um, Anyone know what this is? Uh, so this is, uh, these are wearables. Um, you know, I work in the, in the emergency department and uh, I distinctly remember several years ago where I had a kid with uh, Wolf Parkinson White who had a normal heart rate when they came in, but they had complained about, um, they had complaints of uh, palpitations and we were worried about SVT. 
and they they showed me their Apple Watch, and they said yes, you know, and I could see, wow, you really had a, a high heart rate, and and um, we could go from there. But it was the first introduction for me into sort of wearables and and what they can show you, um, even in the past. Uh, and then, so I'm sure many of you get these texts from uh, friends and family, like, what is this? What is this rash? Can you help me? Uh, maybe uh, even for yourself, uh, uh, getting notifications on your phone about, you know, appointments or, or whatnot. Uh, and then uh, if you remember this from back uh, a couple of years ago, um, this these two notifications, so the COVID um, warnings as well as your uh, vaccination uh, QR code. These actually came out of Washington um, State Department of Health, the Office of uh, Innovation and Technology. And these are sort of, again, forms of digital health that really let us kind of go about our day um, during pandemic. Uh, and then anyone know what, what this is? So um, in endocrine clinic, this is more and more popular and we see them in the emergency department. These are continuous glucose monitors. And so uh, they no longer have to do um, pokes all the time, but they have a continuous reading. And it can be um, sent to their phone or their parents' and loved ones' phones, et cetera. Uh, on the right side, um, I'm just going to kind of tell you guys, this is actually um, a totally fake computer-generated image using uh, the quote-unquote AI, using um, uh, Dolly uh, online. and. All pretty much most of the pictures in my talk are actually generated from from AI, and I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of this is kind of what you can do now. I asked it to to show me a CGM, and you can see it's not quite a CGM on the boy's arm, but uh, the reading was three hundred, and uh, the parents were concerned. And so those were some of the prompts, just give you an idea of of what's capable, um, what we're capable of now, even in talks. And so. Uh, I, I saw that Dr. Trion's in on the call, and so he's really helped bring this uh, device into our emergency department. But if you've seen this before, this is called a whisper otoscope, and it's attachable head to a reg regular otoscope, but it, it can capture images and you can actually show um, and present that otitis media that you might see. Uh, similarly, on the right side, this uh, device uh, series is called TitoCare, and it's meant to be an at-home, direct-to-consumer uh, peripheral exam uh, examination tools that you can buy at Best Buy or Amazon or something and um, be able to do a physical exam and send those images to the uh, doctor or provider. In the lay press, you might have seen this is just from this week. Uh, so YouTube is now putting sort of health instructional videos online. Um, a couple of years ago, chatbots in the ER at UW could help you understand some of the social determinants of health. Um, and then also from this week, Google AI has better bedside manner than human doctors and makes better diagnosis. So it's pretty um, sort of fantastic and, and kind of wild what's out there. Uh, and even from last week's provider, Grand Rounds, if you attended, um, Dr. Ellington uh, was showing the All Right um, app and uh, even how digital health can be used in a global health setting uh, for lung in infections, et cetera. So I thought this was a nice transition uh, even after last week. And so the question is, is this all digital health, right? What is digital health? And so it's a very, very broad question. Um, this website is from um, the FDA, actually the um, US Food and Drug Administration, and about the scope of digital health. So all these categories, mobile, wearable, telehealth, telemedicine, it's like everything um, with a computer and it's all within scope. I wanted to include the stuff on the left just because, as I will talk about later, the FDA is really coming strong on um, creating digital health centers of excellence and, and really starting to regulate this, as you might imagine. So I can give you my definition of digital health for better or for worse. This may not be, um, you, you sort of take it for what it is as my interpretation of it. And so I define digital health as just the use of electronic technology tools in order to try to address and achieve the quadruple aim, which we're all familiar with. So we're trying to um, improve pop health or quality of health. We're trying to reduce cost. We're trying to improve the, the satisfaction and the experience for both the patients and definitely for the provider as well. And so um, digital health can be used in different ways, either for the provider side or the patient side, or it's like a mix of both. But what's really unique about um, digital health, in my opinion, is it does focus on a personalized or self-management tactic where we're trying to get um, patients, families to, to be able to 
take control of their health care. It's patient driven, patient centered. Um, and be able to manage their own healthcare outside the hospital walls. Um, this, I often feel like this little guy on the right um, chipping away at this, this huge mountain uh, when it comes to talking about digital health. It's an enormous topic and we're only gonna cover a sliver of it. And so here are some examples of digital health. I highlight patient facing, cause that's mostly what I wanna talk about, but it could be provider facing as well for sure. Um, so patients and, um, and our, our patients go through telehealth or maybe they've got wearables. Um, RPM stands for remote patient monitoring, which we'll talk about. They've got different apps. They've, uh, you know, even the patient portal um, is a form of digital health. You're managing, your, your, you're communicating with your doctor or your provider. You're managing your, your appointments. Um, you see your prescriptions sometimes. And so... Um, that kind of communication back and forth definitely can count. Um, there are some chat bots that you might have seen uh, from different hospital systems to get information all the way to like virtual reality or gamification of, of different exercises or therapies. For the provider side, um, we're really looking to help with like real time clinical guidance, um, creating efficiencies in our workflows, um, uh, preventing sort of that Swiss cheese model from, from happening, finding the gaps in care. Project Echo is a sort of virtual train the trainer. Um, and then we're definitely very interested in trying to use the EHR with whatever AI tools or analytics tools we can use in order to get better data to take care of our patients. And so this is a busy slide, but try to give you a sense of what has given rise to digital health. It's it's very it's a very hot sort of watchword in, in the lay press. And so Ideally, digital health, it's, it's rapidly scalable because a lot of times it's an app or something over the internet, like you just pass it to so many people um, all at once. Uh, it's supposed to increase our access. So just like telehealth, it takes um, geography out of the picture. And so you can just jump geography, no problem over the internet. And so it's supposed to be cost savings because it's so scalable, because you don't have to have the patient come in as much, uh, et cetera. Um, Using this big data, these big data sets, ideally we can pull out these trends and find gaps in care, um, trying to find uh, sort of the danger spots. Uh, again, like I said, it's a push towards personalization. That's definitely something that has uh, been socialized for all of us. It's supposed to save time by automation, um, saving waste. It definitely is supposed to address provider burnout. And then overall, especially in Western society, there's this overall push to technology. And so digital health is part of that. And then, um, you know, a lot of the funding, I'm just trying to show the funding for digital health companies on the right side, um, it's billions. So 52 billion in 2021, it tailed off in 2023, and this is supposed to be a bounce back year. But, uh, you know, global, uh, sorry, even US healthcare spending is about six, uh, sorry, four trillion in uh, 2021, it's supposed to hit six trillion by uh, 2028. So all these uh, startups are, are trying to, to try to capitalize in on that. And so I just want to start talking about digital health with the most familiar form, which is telehealth. And so this was um, was novel a couple of years ago. I, I've come here and, and talked about this in the past, and we're going to talk beyond telehealth. But just to give you a quick update, I guess, about what um, Seattle Children's is doing. So uh, we're very familiar with it. Uh, most pediatric institutions have um, adopted telehealth and have kept it in some form as part of their, their normal operations. It's no longer even considered innovation anymore. It's just a, a care modality. Most places, uh, pediatric shops have settled in the 10 to 25% range, and we're kind of right in there around 20 to 25% for ambulatory virtual visits. Um, again, fake doctor on the right, fake patients. You see Seattle Children's, they didn't quite get the logo right. Um, but uh, he is wearing a headset, which is what we recommend for, for telehealth visits. Uh, this is sort of our experience in a nutshell. Um, for the three years prior to pandemic, uh, we did very little ambulatory, and then we suddenly went vertical and then have settled out afterwards. Interestingly, the um, dips in the um, in the visits are summer, summer break. I thought that was interesting. And then another way to look at it uh, just regionally, uh, on the left, we have the three years sort of prior to pandemic. And then we have a pandemic till now on the right side. You see that we've definitely expanded our virtual visits um, all over the Whammy region, as well as Alaska and Hawaii as well. 
So different flavors of telehealth uh, at Seattle Children's, we have uh, looked at all these. We don't do all of these, but we've certainly looked at them and thought about them. And so synchronous, uh, kind of just like right now I'm on this video conference, but uh, most of you are familiar with ambulatory visit, uh, telehealth visits. Uh, we've started doing inpatient consultations. So I'll talk about in just a sec, uh, even to the point of teleresuscitation, which is exciting and scary all at the same time. Uh, with the nursing crunch, there are several systems, uh, hospital systems that have really looked at virtual nursing, uh, trying to expedite sort of admission discharge, um, having, trying to uh, mitigate uh, nursing burnout, um, et, et cetera. And so that's been really popular uh, most recently. Things like telesitting, where you can have one person monitoring several different uh, rooms. And then asynchronous, uh, things like store and forward. I had this rash, I sent it on to uh, somebody for an inter um, for their diagnosis and they get it back, but not in real time. Uh, diagnostic interpretation, so we do EKG and EEG reads for other hospitals and that's asynchronous, not in real time. And then e-consults, which is something we will eventually be trying to launch. Um, and that's sort of a communication between a PCP and a specialist and then uh, get back to you in a couple of days uh, to answer a very uh, clear clinical question. Remote patient monitoring, I'll also talk about sort of wearables and, and the power of that. And then there's this concept of hospital at home, uh, which is really trying to avoid an inpatient uh, bed being used and trying to keep that patient at home with a full suite of virtual um, options in order to take care of that uh, sort of low acuity, low risk patient at home. And so I want to uh, really highlight uh, the work that uh, Dr. Rachel Umoran from Neonatology is doing. Um, she serves as our inpatient uh, medical uh, medical director for inpatient telehealth. And so she's really started building this um, network of, of community hospitals that we provide virtual medical direction for, for the um, neonatology sort of sector. And Dr. Reed Ferris from the PICU is, is starting to follow in, in um, those footsteps as well. And we're starting to spread to community inpatient sites. And so um, you can see the map here, um, blue was where we started and orange is starting to expand some more. And so um, her team, the neonatology team is using uh, telehealth carts like on the right side to really do um, real-time consultations for inpatients at these different community hospitals. Even to the point of teleresuscitation, there have been some really um, inspiring stories around sort of these births that haven't gone quite right, and they were able to get a neonatologist on the cart and be able to basically save a life, transport them down to, to main campus, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Moran is also leading us in a teleneo study, which is run out of Mayo Clinic, which is really trying to bring neonatology specialty care um, to community birth centers. And so after inpatient um, consultations for telehealth, I want to talk about uh, remote patient monitoring. Some people call it remote patient management, RPM. And so this is a, a really nice sort of primer, a nice paper, uh, Pediatrics 2022. You might recognize some of the names on here. <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Kellen Foster, Dr. Kristen Kahn, they all were former uh, residents, beloved uh, from Seattle Children's. They bring up this um, concept and they have some really nice diagrams about how remote patient monitoring generally has this component of a patient family activity and also has a healthcare team activity. And so either it could be the patient family initiates and the healthcare team reacts or vice versa, but there's generally this interplay between the two. Someone's at home, someone's in the clinic or in the hospital, and they, um, they work together to achieve their health goals. So there are several RPM cases that have been shown in the literature for uh, RPM. Uh, one of the most popular ones has been early discharge from the hospital from an inpatient setting. And so in the NICU um, uh, setting, the quote unquote feeders and growers, those who are almost well just waiting to get the full feeds, um, several places have tried to send those kids home earlier with RPM, remote patient monitoring. Um, with uh, a combination of, of telehealth virtual, um, as well as things like oxygen saturation, et cetera. And so uh, University of Virginia uh, was able to send um, some of these NICU grads home a full uh, eight days earlier than the control. Um, and they achieved full NG feeds. And um, again, eight inpatient days from a NICU is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, OHSU did a second study, a uh, similar study, where they were able to get five full days saved, but um, had a little bit uh, more um, frequent readmission in the very preemie patients. For 
for complex care, medically complex patients, uh, remote patient monitoring has also been shown to, to really save um, ICU time as well as, as money. And so uh, this 2019 study was for Advocate um, out in Illinois, and it showed that using uh, RPM technology like the Tidal Care system I had shown had lower hospitalization rates in the ICU, which ended up um, having more savings. Uh, they sort of were uh, able to nip it in the bud when there was a, um, a problem developing. And so they were able to monitor that from, from the clinical setting and then jump in even though the patient was at home. Uh, 2023, uh, this is from Mercy, uh, the Mercy system out of Missouri. Uh, they had a 35% reduction in hospitalization, 44% reduction in ED visits, 17% reduction in charges. But again, um, so if you're familiar with Mercy, they actually have a full digital hospital where there are no patients in it. It's just people doing this monitoring 24-7, um, actually. And so they're able to, again, nip it in the bud and reduce uh, these uh, the, reduce these hospitalizations because they jumped on it early uh, for these kiddos. Uh, from a population health uh, uh, monitoring level, things like the CGM, um, diabetes control, things like that can be very useful. Um, it's re remote patient monitoring, it's reviewing the glucose data. And there is this concept of hospital at home, which uh, started uh, Johns Hopkins in 1995, really showing that patients could be cared for, low acuity, low risk patients could be cared for in the home with a full suite of uh, of virtual options and monitoring options. Uh, they've been plugging away at it. And, and finally, especially during pandemic, CMS has started recognizing that and actually having billing codes for this. They have a program called Hospital Without Walls and that uh, also uh, spun off an acute hospital at home. So more in the adult setting, uh, ho pediatric hospitals really haven't picked up on this yet, but it's in the adult setting, uh, as well as the e-epilepsy monitoring unit. So. I know Dr. Rusty Novotny has, has sort of looked at that as well here, um, trying to see, can we actually do some of the um, EEGs uh, at home uh, that are sort of low risk, et cetera. And then finally, uh, I'll, I'll spend some time talking about the single ventricle um, case, use case for remote patient monitoring. Um, a lot of pediatric institutions, academic centers start with RPM in this space. And so, uh, out of Children's Mercy, uh, Kansas City, um, there is uh, something called the CHAMP program, Cardiac High Acuity Monitoring Program. And uh, what it is, is a um, home monitoring system where the patient uh, goes home for these single ventricle kids, these hypoplastic left hearts, interstage. So post Norwood, pre Glenn. So after their first stage, um, and then before their second stage, they go home. And they go home with these digital monitoring tools. Um, historically, this has been an extraordinarily high uh, mortality rate. Um, around 2000, um, the year 2000, the mortality rate for these kids interstage was like 15 to 20 percent. Um, it was around 12 percent here at Seattle Children's. Uh, and since instituting the monitoring um, for this CHAMP program, we've seen mortality for this interstage, these um, uh, interstage patients uh, really drop pretty dramatically. So they, they record a weight, um, some put in eyes and nose in, input, I'll put um, some they put in the pulse oximetry and a heart rate, uh, and then they record a short video clip, and this goes into the, the cloud, and it's reviewed by the clinical team, the cardiology team, and if there's some threshold that's exceeded, an alert can go out. Um, here at Seattle Children's, we're very fortunate to be led by Dr. Matt Files and Emily Bay, and so uh, in 2021, we did transition over to an EPIC tool, but from 2016 to 2021, we, we were participating in CHAMP and we saw our um, home mortality rate for these interstage patients drop um, almost to zero. I mean, there are a combination of things, but CHAMP was part of it. And so just a couple studies, this has been looked at uh, pretty thoroughly. And so uh, in this one first study at the top, they dropped their mortality, interstage mortality from 17 to 3%. And they saw that the addition of these video clips really um, accurately predicted um, when patients would need readmission or intervention. And so they're looking at things like respiratory rate and the effort and color through the video. And then the second study down below, um, for those kids who ended up having a coarctation, a recoarctation who needed catheterization, they realized that um, a lot of the home data coming in was more frequent in the seven days leading up. So the thought was that the parents or guardians recognized that uh, the kid was getting a little bit worse and so entered more data. 
And so the idea is that more home monitoring, more data leads to earlier intervention, which leads to better outcome. But the flip side is that also it's it's more data for the team to review. And so they still have to make the call if something is really going on or not. This third study is a little bit older, but this was comparing CHAMP to um, a three ring binder, like a paper um, checklist that had similar kinds of, of data recordings. The difference was that the paper binder was reviewed weekly by the team versus the CHAMP data was reviewed daily. And what it ended up showing is that their, um, the CHAMP uh, kids got uh, less, they, they needed to use the ICU less because again, the main issues, the deterioration was picked up earlier. However, I thought it was interesting to note that these CHAMP kids also had higher readmissions, higher red flags noted, higher ED visits. Um, and so again, there's this idea, this recurring theme in digital health where we can get early warnings, um, early, which will lead to earlier interventions and less morbidity, less costs on the system, less ICU time, decreased mortality, but it's gonna take some investment in time and resources to operationalize that, to have people to be monitoring that data. And throughout all of these digital health solutions, you see that theme going through uh, throughout. Uh, basically, you need more touches and you get better care, but you still need more touches, even if they're virtual. Uh, so other ways that uh, digital health has been used in pediatrics. So we talked about the early warning. Um, there are several studies on uh, digital health tools being used for peer support or sending messages of encouragement or support, especially in the adolescent young adult um, uh, sort of a subgroup. Uh, there's been some studies saying that um, adolescents and young adults feel more comfortable uh, revealing difficult topics or chatting with a chatbot or a digital tool versus in person. And so um, we're trying to support uh, different behaviors, uh, positive behaviors, coaching. Uh, one subset of patients that has really benefited, I would say, from digital health tools have been um, those who have transportation barriers. Um, those who uh, have complex medical needs or technology dependence, uh, who have de developmental delay, um, anyone who has a hard time coming into a clinical setting in person, digital health has really helped a lot. Notifications nudging, if you have like a smartwatch or a smartphone and it's telling you to exercise more, um, that's what like a nudge is, notifications. And then medication adherence, trying to make sure that uh, patients are taking their meds. So this is one study uh, looking at specifically uh, meta-analysis looking for pediatric asthma medication adherence. Uh, the adult studies have been very positive. So when you have a digital tool that helps um, remind adult patients to take their meds, uh, do their puffs, et cetera, it actually ends up for better um, outcome uh, for a quality standpoint. Uh, this meta-analysis was looking at some of the different tools that are out there. And so just to give you a sense, it's like if um, it's a physical device that you attach to your, your inhaler, your MDI, and it's like uh, it's Bluetooth enabled or, or paired to your phone. And so every time you puff, every time you press the um, MDI or maybe it's a disc, uh, it records that. And so the app knows when you're using your inhaler. It can give you feedback on if you're using it not enough or too much. It also can link into the, the cloud and, and give you um, uh, advice on whether or not you should be uh, using the meds more because the AQI is bad or because there's a pollen, high pollen count, or because the weather has changed, et cetera. And it can really record this medication adherence and feedback to the provider saying, you know, someone with severe persistent asthma is not taking their um, their uh, daily medication. Um, and so it can also predict if you're about to have a flare, you can use the medication. So um, the upshot is that there haven't been great pediatric studies uh, that sort of really showing the benefit of these digital tools for pediatric asthma, but it's been shown in adults. And so we're just waiting for it to, to trickle down to pediatrics. Uh, just a side note um, that I wanted to highlight kind of some of the challenges, um, maybe on that hype side of digital tools. And so we've actually tried this at um, Seattle Children's. Uh, you may have been uh, part of the, the pilot. And so thank you if you were, uh, but uh, we tried to roll this out to um, partnering uh, PCP clinics. We had the goal of trying to reduce ED asthma visits by 10%. And we tried to hand out these kinds of Bluetooth enabled uh, devices. Uh, and so some of the challenges, and we ended up shutting it down, but some of the challenges were uh, enrollment, getting patients to, to buy in, PCPs to buy into this. Um, 
it's always uh, you have you're taking time away from their visit, so it's challenging. Excuse me. Um, the technical support and troubleshooting uh, the devices, trying to figure out how to pair it. Do you have Wi-Fi or not? Do you have a phone or not? And do you need to have some sort of hub sent to your um, your house? And then just prioritizing uh, this kind of uh, workflow, it, it takes a lot. And so the learning point for us was that it really takes a fair amount of will, willpower to operationalize this, um, meet the patients where they are, uh, meet the providers where they are. It takes sort of investment of time, resource, um, and just having a, a great champion for it. Um, so I think it was a good learning lesson for us. Uh, so Alarms and, and warnings are another uh, subset of, of digital health that can be used. Uh, if you're familiar with the CGM, uh, it's been great. And in terms of when the patient's at school, if they have a high or a low, the, the parent can be notified. Um, and so it really fills this gap where you have this constant monitoring and you can uh, pull out the, the high and lows, the alarms. And so it's like this constant vigilance, which is always difficult to do, but it's like this digital vigilance. And I have this picture on the upper right, um, which is clearly an advertisement for the smart baby sock you might have seen or heard of. I've seen some of them come into the emergency department, but it's a sock that you wear that measures your heart rate and your um, your saturation, your oxygen saturation. And so, you know, everyone is sleeping comfortably. <laughs> That's how you know it's a, a advertisement. But everyone's sleeping comfortably because there's this constant monitoring, and there's that idea for remote patient monitoring for that. Uh, and then. We've talked mostly about patient um, digital health, uh, but provider uh, pr digital health, you know, alarms can be really useful, especially in the EHR. And so there have been a bunch of studies that have shown that um, it can, the EHR and then sort of the algorithms can look at all the data and really flag when there are anomalies or alerts, um, things like nephrotoxic drugs. It will look at your med list and say, well, you shouldn't add this other med because you have some high creatinine and renal insufficiency. And so it's been really successful um, and shown to be very successful, especially in teledialysis. But um, it's really an example of how um, the digital health tools can fill some of the gaps and be constantly vigilant. And then I wanted to uh, introduce this idea of digital therapeutics. And so you might have heard this term before. Um, it's definitely gaining in popularity, and it's a little bit different than some of the other stuff I've talked about. So digital therapeutics are those um, those products that are, are software as a medical device. So we've heard of software as a service, was SAAS, and this is SAMD. And so these are intended to be a true medical intervention, um, driven by software, but they are more evidence-based. They've got clinical trials. Um, they've almost all been published in peer-reviewed journals. It's really meant to be direct treatment, augmenting um, the current therapy that's going on, um, but it's not sort of like a pedometer, checking your steps, getting you to be more fit or healthy. It's not monitoring your glucose or your heart rate or anything like that. It's really meant to be an intervention. And so if in that vein, it's, it's meant to be certified or cleared as a medical device. And so in some places, it's even available um, via prescription. And so there are some pediatric examples of this. I just want to point out um, on the left is something called Migraine Manager. And Cincinnati Children's is actually really studying this and looking at this. This is when the patient um, interacts with their uh, app and they, enter, they have migraines. They're entering in their headache diaries, but also getting very prescriptive or, or specific advice on, on what to do for those headaches. Um, on a daily basis even. And so they've been able to show month over month improvement in headache frequency and severity, um, but they were able to publish in the journal Headache. And so it is something that is um, definitely being studied. Uh, there's a trial out there that you can sign up for. On the right side is something called Luminopia, which is um, using a commercial uh, virtual reality device. The software is, is meant to um, treat amblyopia up to age seven. And what it does is you you wear this thing and you watch TV for like an hour a day, six days a week up to age seven. And it has um, blurriness in one of the eyes. Um, it's like the stronger eye blurs out versus the weaker eye is more clear. And so it's meant to, so you basically start using that weaker eye. Uh, again, they publish in ophthalmology and they're able to show that in terms of number of lines that the patient can track and, and read, 
it's um, actually improved with this with this therapeutic. So that's an example of, of um, a digital therapeutic that's also been studied. Uh, that's the sort of the what sets digital therapeutics apart is that they're definitely more studied and and um, proven. Ah, so this picture is meant to uh, remind me that we're about to hit the big iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, as where I put the arrow, um, which is artificial intelligence. And so I am by no means any expert in, in artificial intelligence. I'm not really qualified to speak expertly on it. I can introduce uh, some of the concepts uh, if it's helpful. But I, I do want to say this is a big deal. This is uh, the hype in this case. I, I think the hype is real. And I think we need to prepare for it as, as people who work in pediatrics. And so um, when you hear the term AI, um, most people in the lay press and everything, when they're saying AI, what they're mostly referring to is something called machine learning. Um, and machine learning is when you take these huge data sets and you try to uh, you try to train a computer model to extract the pattern from that data set. Um, you try to, and, and in some cases you can even predict what comes next. So this can apply to um, text or images or sounds. Um, that is generally what people mean for AI. Um, it's different from AGI, which is not your adjusted gross income, but it stands for artificial general intelligence, which is like Terminator, kind of like um, scary stuff. And that's not generally what we mean by AI. We mean more machine learning, drawing patterns out of the, um, the noise, essentially. And then you have these things called the large language models. Um, ChatGPT is, which you've heard a lot about, is one of them. And these are, um, are kind of these machine learning ad libs if you ever played ad libs so where like it, it prompts you for the word and you put it in so uh these large language models have been trained on basically the entire internet so the data set is the entire internet plus plus and it's just really really good at predicting what the next word is going to be and so um it's like autocomplete but but way way more accurate and way more compelling and there is this um a little bit of this black box phenomenon where uh the output of of these llms can't totally be understood or traced back to an origin it's like it comes up with some stuff that you're not exactly sure how it came up with it it wasn't trained on it it just it, it knows it somehow or it, it spits it out somehow and that's the part that a lot of people are are kind of amazed by um and so for example uh, uh sorry because it's just putting out what it um it's just repeating the ad libs part. Sometimes it can be wrong. And so it sounds very compelling. It sounds like it's correct, but it's actually, it's totally wrong. And so they call this a hallucination. And so the example that is on the right side, I put in the prompt, the healthcare AI self-portrait and, and make it in a friendly and a cartoonish style. And so it created this robot thing that looks very friendly. And then his clipboard says, heatings, which I guess is greetings. I'm not sure, but Again, hallucinating. I'm not sure where this came from. Looks very compelling. Um, I don't know what heatings means. And then in the lay press, uh, you'll see these medically related uh, things like, so uh, chat GPT passed the step one and 45%. They fed in the questions and spit out the right one. But then like when they tried to um, enter the neonatology boards questions, it, it failed, um, although it got really good on ethics. And so that that's sort of what you see in the lay press is like they feed in the questions to get the output. And so again, lay press. So this is just a couple of days ago. Um, uh, it's actually a really great read. It's a Q and A with some of the people from the, um, the Department of Computer Science over at UW, and they actually have a working paper which I have a link to in the in, at the end of this talk, which is language models: a guide for the perplexed, and it kind of spells it all out, which I liked. And then um, again, from earlier this week, Google Google has put out their uh, healthcare or med related AI. And it's pretty, uh, it's pretty interesting. So they've done some uh, interesting studies where they, for example, uh, they had a, um, a patient actor evaluate a conversation from a real patient or a randomized AI program. And they, um, they sort of graded it on empathy and sort of um, uh, real realness, I guess. And so the AI turned out to be pretty empathetic. And then they went to the New England Journal of uh, Medicine and pulled out some really challenging cases. And then they gave it to a human uh, a clinician and said, create me a differential diagnosis. 
and uh, it, it, uh, the human put out this differential diagnosis. Then they had a human with open internet and put out a differential diagnosis. And then it had a human assisted with Google's AI. And then it had AI alone. And so, and then they graded them all. And apparently the Google AI had the, um, the most thorough and accurate differential diagnosis list. So interesting, you see it in the lay press. Um, and, and so that's kind of where this is going. And so to that, um, and I just wanted to briefly talk about digital health options for providers where I might see things going. And so, um, yeah, you can have AI help you for diagnostic assistance. Um, Real-time decision guidance is, is a hope that we will have. Um, the predictive analytics, um, early warning we talked about, and even having patients um, put in, you know, do a chatbot conversation to, get, to triage out their symptoms, that would be really helpful for providers. There are AI tools that you just have the conversation with a patient and it's generating your note in the background, which would be amazing uh, for all of us. Uh, dealing with pre-auth and, and insurance companies, these letters you can auto-generate. Uh, same with letters to patients or um, messaging to the patients. You can sort of generate those via AI. And then um, really trying to, to make it very personalized to that patient. You can have different rules and, and use digital health tools to help you communicate one to many. So it's one provider to many patients and it all sounds very personalized. And then definitely with translation and interpretation, that's the hope. And so we've talked a lot about um, the hope of, of digital health. Um, ideally, we'd be able to reduce disparities. We'd be able to reduce ge geographical barriers, um, do more with less. You know, augment um, clinical decisions, and then after Dr. Rivera's talk, was thinking about the future of the the specialty workforce in pediatrics, and can we use these tools to stabilize our workforce, to augment it, etc. But there's hype, and I uh, want to make sure I don't just breeze over this. But there's things about privacy and vulnerabilities. We talk about the digital divide. There's all this data. What do we do with it? I'm tired of all these alerts that pop up. There's inherent bias and ethics issues. Is it good to have kids in front of screens so much? Um, a lot of AI has not been trained in pediatrics um, data, so it's it's how you know how can we trust it? And again, I already talked about the value proposition, but like we can lower the cost, improve quality, but it's going to take more touches. And are we ready for that? And can we trust what's coming out of these tools? And so I just want to breeze through some of the stuff. But as you know, privacy can be hacked. Um, we even had cases um, that patient data was sold during pandemic by third party uh, telehealth companies. They sold them to social media for advertising and tech companies. It was kind of a big scandal. There are vulnerabilities, uh, especially for adolescents, uh, young adults. They may be more inclined to um, trust sort of sketchy information that comes out of digital health tools. Um, they may be more susceptible to privacy breaches. Uh, this is a great paper by Charlene Wong, uh, formerly of Seattle Children's fame, uh, that talks about this uh, population and some of the risks. And then the digital divide, really who has access, right? So technology, internet, um, do you speak English as a primary language or not? Who can charge your devices? Who has that Bluetooth stuff for like those devices I talked about previously? And even who can access the portal? This is a big deal. Um, people who are in these studies, is there selection bias? Is there cherry picking of which patients can, can afford these things? And so there's definitely um, a digital divide that happens in digital health, for sure. We see that we saw that in, in telehealth when we rolled it out. Um, there are a bunch of studies. I won't get into them. Uh, the first one is from Colleen Gutman also, and, uh, and Casey Lyon, so also of Seattle Children's fame. But um, there are definitely um, studies that show digital health can increase um, uh, the digital divide. And then there's inherent bias. So how you train these AI models really makes a difference. And so especially in the insurance world where they're using AI prediction algorithms to justify denial of claims, there have been several controversies as I've listed here. Um, garbage in, garbage out is sort of GIGO for the algorithms. It's only going to be as good as, as what you put in. And so also when you have these large data sets and draw extrapolate these, these signals or these patterns, I think there's also an ethical concern about um, what you find, how you reveal it, et cetera. And having um, policies for that's really important. Um, there's getting to be more rigor um, in this field, thankfully. So like I said, the FDA is starting to regulate a lot more. They have a digital health uh, center of excellence and they have these digital health experts. 
Um, there are these alliances and um, collaborations that are coming up. Um, New England Journal has actually spun off an AI uh, sort of section to, to look at and really do those kind of clinical trials. And so there are metrics being and frameworks that are being developed, which is really important for us. Uh, pediatrics has many opportunities. Uh, you may uh, know people in these institutions. Um, we all participate in something called KidsX, which is uh, a accelerator which partners these startups with pediatric sites, clinical sites, to see if there's a good match. Uh, if you're interested in that for us, our contact here is Chuck Magnus. And so this is just a slide of all the different um, companies that are out there. There's so many more, but they're getting funded uh, for specifically for pediatric health. You see mental health, infant care, um, remote monitoring. These are all very popular sort of areas to work in. Okay, so this is the crux of it, and I'll just finish up in the next five minutes or so, but um, where's this all going? So uh, how are we supposed to incorporate this uh, stuff into our jobs in the future? Is my job at risk? Um, how are we going to train medical students, residents, fellows in this new era? How are we ourselves going to adapt? And so uh, I had a complex case the other day, um, a, a sort of diagnostic dilemma, and the resident, um, their first thought um, which I was just stunned by. It's like, let's just ask ChatGPT. And it's like, wow, I never even thought about that. And it was a pretty good differential. So I think, you know, who who's training them or who's training us to, to deal with digital health tools like that? Uh, this one paper really proposed that we start moving this upstream into the medical school curriculum and trying to really specifically teach towards big data, machine learning, um, coding, stuff like that, and, and really teaching us all to critically appraise some of these digital health tools. Um, and like I said before, this is this is a big deal, uh, digital health. It's it's more than just a EHR conversion from one system to the other. It's really going to start changing things, not in like 10 to 20 years, but like really five to 10, If and that may be even a stretch. Um, more and more, we're digital natives or dealing with patients who are digital natives. Um, and so we have, all these cautions, like I talked about, we can improve access and quality, but at what cost? And we need to think about things like digital health literacy, uh, literacy maybe even as a social determinant of health, and can we trust it? I mean, is it going to help or hinder or harm? Again, the alliteration. So concretely, um, you know, what can I do? So digital inclusion, I think when we start off on a digital health project, creating space for a pause and trying to consider, is this equitable? really seeking the evidence between behind these digital health tools and being critical about it. Um, we have to learn about AI, have to expose ourselves, um, co-designing some of these tools with parents and guardians and uh, PCPs and, and everyone who might be involved to really make sure that it's fitting their needs. Um, balancing this monitoring and alerts versus how much people power it's gonna take, um, how much it's gonna cost. Uh, seeking tools to really pull out the signal from the noise and just trying to be open to, to change. And so I wanted to finally just give a, a shout out to some of our team here at Seattle Children's, the Digital Patient Access Care and Engagement, or DPACE team, digital health team. So these are the three main areas of virtual care, immersive engagement, and patient access and engagement. Um, they do things like we have a Seattle Children's app, which you can download. It's very handy for patients on the left. Um, they've even done some pretty fun things like um, trying to record pain management for tonsillectomies, another app they've created. They do things like they're able to start texting uh, patients reminders and their virtual visit links um, in their language of preference, which is uh, their preferred language of care, which is really important. Um, they've, they manage the telehealth loaner device program, again, trying to bridge some of those digital divides. Uh, they're working on a gen AI chatbot, and uh, you might see these around the hospital. These are kind of uh, magic windows that um, they're pretty cool to look at. And so these are my references. Uh, you can uh, take a look at them. Uh, the Peter, so Peter Lee is a guy at Microsoft, but he gave this talk at the Allen School of Computer Science um, down the road, which I thought was really helpful for me to understand AI. And then uh, Washington State Department of Health's uh, digital health paper that just came out um, is also really helpful. And then that um, perplexed LLM paper that I, I mentioned is right there. So a couple of books on top. And then one final thing. So this is an example of what it might look like. So you plug this in, and this is what you get.
So I'll tell you, I did not use this this way, but it's not bad. And this is a real time sort of example of exactly what I've been talking about for the last hour or so. So I will leave you at that. And uh, I think I'm at time, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to answer them. Uh, Theda Ong says, thanks so much for this comprehensive talk. I appreciate your call out for a pause and push for critical appraisal of the limitations for these tools in real time with the large data output from these tools. Is there matching investment in the data analytics and study design for this appraisal? Um, thanks, Theda. I am, so if I'm interpreting the question right, um, in the startup world, there's definitely not as much matching investment. They just want to create something, sell something. And so a lot of times when you're hearing about these products, it's it's very shiny and it's very glossy. Um, so they have not really put in um, the, the analytics and study design. I will say that with regulation uh, becoming more and more apparent with the FDA really treating some of these things as, as medical devices, they are requiring clinical trials. And so my hope is that uh, more of these startups and these companies really do take the time to, um, and they'll be forced to take the time to publish and to really do uh, peer-reviewed studies. Um, the Whisper Otoscope I'm seeing um, is, uh, so it's a, I, I don't know a, a ton about it. I've seen it in our emergency department before, but it's a um, attachment that goes onto a regular otoscope head that you has video and um, still image capture ability. And so you look at it just like you would a, a normal otoscope, and then you can freeze the picture. Um, I will say from the informatics side, we've had some challenges trying to get that image into uh, our EHR, into Epic. And so sometimes we're having to take a picture of the picture, but it's been really useful in terms of showing um, otolaryngology, what we're seeing, or even from uh, trainees to attendings as they're staffing a patient able to show uh, what they see. Use AI to comfort depressed and lonely patients, especially teens with suicide thoughts. Uh, thanks, Greg. So that this is actually really um, interesting because it is an area that's fraught with uh, risk when you have someone who is expressing suicidal ideation over a chatbot. Um, there's a lot of push for these companies in mental health, pediatric mental health, to really um, create these AIs where you're having this conversation. And in the beginning, it was it was too high risk. People didn't want to risk the patient expressing SI and then not being able to deal with it. Um, the stuff that I've seen most recently has actually been shown that um, the, the AI conversations have actually been almost on par with, with, in, with the real person, which is kind of amazing. But when I've talked to um, psychologists and psychiatrists, they've, they've said this is actually better than nothing. And so I think it's getting there. And there have been some studies that show that teens do prefer that kind of interaction versus an in-person conversation. Um, what strategies do you think uh, digital health needs to incorporate to help shrink the digital divide? That's a tough uh, question, Jeff. Um, I think recognition is sort of just ground level. We need to understand that no matter how um, how you know shiny it is or, or amazing it is, uh, Everyone has to be able to use it, I think. And so you really have to be very thoughtful about that. I think coupling um, the the tool with alternatives or options or like the loaner program, like for telehealth is, is really important. But this is where I think we need to pause to, to really build in that pause as just part of our checklist of when we launch something. And in some cases, we might just say that we can't do this because it's not equitable. Um, data locally here at children. So investment in analytics uh, in, for digital health tools. We definitely have a partnership with analytics uh, theta in terms of our, our DPACE team or digital health team, but um, it may not be as robust to um, sort of fund studies um, without sort of external funding. Um, who else should be involved in developing medical student curriculum? Uh, I actually think that we should be asking um, students and, and trainees. I am myself not a digital native, and I'm often kind of amazed at, at my own kids or, or younger people, what they can do. So I would actually start asking them to help create a curriculum and 
um, people who are interested in it. I actually think it would be a great sort of um, research, um, an area of research, as well as curriculum development. Uh, what kind of barriers have we encountered with implementation? Uh, remote consultations, RPM, uh, resources of partnering hospitals or patient resources. So um, very classically, um, licensure, um, credentialing have been big barriers to, to inpatient consultations remotely. Getting proxy credentialing for systems is really important. Um, during pandemic even, it was really hard to just suddenly do an inpatient consult in a different hospital. We had to go through the formal credentialing process. So I'm really hoping that um, both at the federal and state level, we can get some help there in terms of um, the, the barriers and the bureaucracy, and then just having a more streamlined process for how we get credentialing and sped up that kind of credentialing is really important. Um, talk more about the use of chat GPT and resident teaching for diagnostic tools. So if you basically list a bunch of symptoms or in some cases just throw an image into chat GPT or they have GPT-4 now available, um, you can actually get a differential diagnosis. It's kind of scary. Some of the, and, and it sounds very plausible. Like I always ask for it to give me references so I can at least look at the primary references. But chat GPT for a long time, I don't know if it's changed, never gave references. And so you don't know what's true and not true. Um, Co-designing with doctors and parents, is there any SCH committee initiative addressing this currently? Yes. So in the IT department, as many other departments, um, we do have patient advisory boards that um, we do try to present to. But I think doing listening sessions and trying to really get focus groups together even before we launch would be even better. Um, how do we address physician burnout? Um, not sure, I'm not sure having all access 24 seven should be goal. And this is really um, the one of the cruxes of it, Daria, is that for telehealth, like you, we can do amazing things, but it still takes a person to review it and to decide and things like that. And maybe the technology eventually will get to the point where we trust some sort of automation to do that. But when it comes to like changing meds or like you need to come in to the ER or something like that, it, it's still a little bit, it's a stretch right now. What opportunities do you see uh, using digital tech in the setting of digital uh, disaster response? That feels like a, uh, a good setup there. So uh, disaster response and surge response, um, as you may know, uh, Seattle Children's led by Danielle Zur, we're part of the Pediatric Pandemic Network, which is a federal grant. And so we are trying to figure out how we respond to the next pandemic. Um, digital tools, um, digital health tools can really help bridge those geographic areas, like not just um, telehealth or telemedicine, but like the monitoring. And so setting up uh, remote patient monitoring or hospitals, even in, in, in homes, could be a next step. That'd be pretty great. The, the nice thing about digital health is whether they're in different states or, or, or just next door, it's kind of the same. Like I could be in Hawaii right now giving this talk, but I'm not. But uh, you get the idea. I think I answered it and I still have a minute left. Thank you, Mark. Um, for everyone, I think we'll go ahead and end there and let him relax a little bit. Excellent, excellent presentation, Mark. Thank you very much. And for everyone who's still on, uh, just a reminder, we're going to be remote only for the next uh, three weeks. And so we'll keep you guys updated if we come back in person. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, all.